Okay, Psalm 122. Let me read this passage. It's on page 612. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. I want to ask a question of any children or teenagers here, and I want you to be completely honest. Has it ever happened on a Sunday morning when your parents said, okay, time for church, time to go to church, you responded something like this, why do we have to go to church every Sunday? All right. Be honest. Raise your hand if you've done that. I, I'm a pastor. I can tell if you're lying. So, okay. Okay, that's good. How about you adults? <laughs> the hands are like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's this little Sundays, like the middle of February when there's like two hours of sunlight and you just want to lay in bed in a cocoon and just lay there all day and hope someone will bring you coffee. Uh, or maybe those, those days in the summer where it's a really warm Sunday, you know, like those three days in the summer, it's like that, and you're like, I want to go to the beach, just go to the beach. Well, since we're all being totally candid, uh, I have those days where I'm not excited to come to church, and I'm paid to be here. I mean, you'd think I'd be like, yay, money, but you know, there's just those days where I drag my feet, where I have less than a spring in my step to be in the house of the Lord. In fact, some might even take it further and say, well, why do you need to go to church at all? I mean, why do you have to go to some building? Can't I just go walk on Nantasket Beach in the morning and be close to God or nature or the universe or whatever and, and, and just kind of feel something there? I mean, why do you have to go to a place and, and why on a Sunday? I think our attitude sometimes can be far from what we're seeing here in Psalm 122 where the psalmist seems pretty stoked. Look at Psalm 122 verse 1. He says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Time to go to the house of the Lord. And he's going, yes, oh yeah, everything is awesome. And he's celebrating and he's fired up to go to the house of the Lord. And I have to confess, and it sounds like you did too, that I don't always have that response to gathering with God's people. Even those of us who are committed to regular regularly being in a church, those of you who are members, those of you who have really good church attendance records, uh, not that we're keeping track, um, but you know who you are. Even you, you have to admit, sometimes you don't feel (coughs) enthusiastic about gathering with God's people on a Sunday morning. So what is it about the psalmist here? Why is it that he was so jubilant about going up to the house of the Lord? What is it that, that excited him? So let's just look at his words and see what we can learn. Um, Let let me first start with the big picture before we get into the verses. Psalm 122 is one of the Psalms of Ascent. So for those of you who are here for the first time this Sunday, or if you've been here and just by way of review, uh, this summer we're looking at Psalms 120 through 134. Every Sunday we're just taking another Psalm. And these are the Psalms of Ascent. They they were Psalms or songs that would be sung Uh, around the theme of the three annual pilgrimages that all of the Israelites would make to Jerusalem. So if you were a a Jewish person in ancient Israel, three times a year, uh, God's law commanded you to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Uh, It was during the the harvest festival. So you would take part of what you harvested, you'd go up to Jerusalem with the other Israelites, you'd present it before the Lord in His temple. so, So there was this pilgrimage that would happen. Wherever you lived in Israel, you had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. And so these journeys, these psalms of ascent, because you always go up to Jerusalem in, in the Bible's way of thinking, these are these songs around this, this theme. In fact, uh, for those of you who've been here the last couple Sundays, 
you might even have noticed by now a progression from Psalm 120 to 122. Psalm 120 was, Lord, beam me up. Get me out of here. I can't stand being around these people who are so wicked. Woe to me, I dwell among the tents of the wicked kind of mentality. Psalm 121 is the traveler's psalm. It's the psalm about the journey. Psalm 122, he's arrived. Look at verse 2 of Psalm 122. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. So, so there's a progression across these three psalms of the pilgrim coming to Jerusalem. So as you read the psalm, it kind of helped me. Maybe it'll help you. I, I, just to use your imagination. Use your imagination and think of an ancient pilgrim. Think of, uh, I don't know, some farmer, some guy traveling to Jerusalem. He's got a, you know, one of those wooden carts with the wooden wheels, and it's being pulled by an ox or a donkey or something. And he's there with his family, and he's got some sheep and a dog and, you know, some produce piled up in the back. And they're just kind of trucking along to Jerusalem, and they're finally arriving at Jerusalem. Or maybe you can imagine a shepherd who shepherds way up in northern Israel, and he's made a four-day trek down to Jerusalem on foot. But here they come, these pilgrims, and, and they finally see this huge city that to them would have seemed like a metropolis given their agrarian backgrounds and their little villages. And they come to this huge city with huge temple and buildings and walls. And, and the pilgrims are so excited. Ah, oh, I rejoiced when they said, let's go up. And finally he's there. My feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. So now, what is it specifically about Jerusalem that has thrilled his soul, that he would write a psalm about it, that it would be that exciting that he would write? And, and I'd like to point out, just looking, getting a little deeper now into the verses here, I'd like to point out that I think there's at least three things that generate this rejoicing, this attitude of anticipation and, and jubilance that, that's coming out of this psalm. That's sort of the, the feel and the emotion of this psalm is excitement and happiness. And, and there's three things that are creating that happiness in the writer. And the first is this. He rejoices about going to Jerusalem because, number one, the presence of the Lord is there. The presence of the Lord is there. God's presence was in Jerusalem. That's number one. Look at verse one. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Now, in Israel in the Old Testament, what was the house of the Lord? What was it? The temple, right? Anyone say temple or did I just say it? I don't know. Anyway, temple. The temple was in Jerusalem, the tabernacle. It was the building where God said, I, I dwell there. Um, you see it again down in verse 9. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. So the psalm begins with the reference to the house of the Lord. It ends to the reference to the house of the Lord. Whenever you see bookends like that in a scriptural passage, that's often one of the ways that writers use to emphasize the main point. So here he's like, well, I want to go up to Jerusalem because that's where the house of the Lord is. It was the temple. And so you go to Jerusalem and there's the temple. And God's presence, God's, God's Spirit was dwelling there in that place. And so here's this pilgrim. And in a sense, he's coming into the presence of God. Now, that uh, is a question sometimes people ask about that. Uh, in fact, my, uh, my 10-year-old asked me this question this, this week. We were, we were reading the Bible and talking about the temple. We were reading in the Old Testament. And, and I said, you know, the temple was important because that's where God's presence was. And my, my 10-year-old said, he said, now, wait a minute. He goes, what do you mean God's presence is there? I thought God was everywhere. I was like, that's a really insightful question for a 10-year-old if I do brag so myself. And I was like, well, good question, son. It's true. God's presence is everywhere. It's everywhere. God's present with you if you uh, are driving across the country. God's present with you if you're laying on an operating table about to go under for a procedure. God is with, God is with us if you're flying in a rocket out in outer space. God is everywhere. He's, he's present in all places. You can pray and talk to God anywhere. It's cool. But that same God also chooses to, and, and he did in the Old Testament, reveal himself or manifest his presence or sort of show up in a special way at certain places. He can also choose to do that. So, so yeah, God is everywhere, and that shepherd who came to Jerusalem, he can talk to God out in his field all year long. And yet, God has also told that shepherd, 
you must come to Jerusalem three times a year and offer sacrifices there. So if you want to be in a right relationship with me, you've got to come here. You can't just do it there on your own terms. Or to put it another way, just because God is everywhere doesn't mean that you and I can worship Him anyhow we want. No, just because God is everywhere doesn't mean, it doesn't follow logically or biblically that, that we can just make up our own religion however we want to make up our own religion, our own spirituality, or for whatever works for us. Because He's God. He has opinions, which are actually laws and commandments. He, he, he tells us who He is, and He tells us how He wants us to come to Him because He's God. And so He told them, Yep, I'm everywhere. You can talk to me everywhere, but you must come to Jerusalem three times a year because I've put my name in the temple in a special way. So this psalmist is so happy because he's going to come to experience God and come into the presence of God in a way that, that doesn't normally happen when he's out with his sheep in his field or out in his fields harvesting and working the soil. A second reason he's excited to come to Jerusalem. Number one, the presence of God is there. Number two, the people of God are there. Number two, the people of God are there. Look at verses 3 and 4. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. And so here we have this image of the tribes going up. They're all there too. Now, I think that the psalmist is doing something kind of interesting literarily in verses 3 and 4. So verse 3, he's talking about the city and how it's built, the walls, the stones, how they're all fit together well. It's a very unified city with all these stones that, that fit nicely into a compacted whole. And then in verse 4, he's talking about the tribes coming together to praise God. And, and I think what's happening is I think that the psalmist is using the language of the stones fitting together as a kind of poetic image of the people fitting together. In fact, where it says it's compacted together, the Hebrew word is it's compacted as one. So, so the walls are a symbol of unity that then are reflected in the people. So all the people are there. That's another reason he's excited to be there, because everybody's there. So three times a year, all the Israelite tribes come together. Most of the time, our imaginary shepherd or farmer or whoever he is or whoever she is, is living in, you know, some podunk village way out in the middle of nowhere, in, you know, behind the backwaters of nowhere. And maybe it's a little village with 50 people, and maybe on some special days like a wedding or something, then there's like 200 people together. But it's just small, small village life. But three times a year, they all travel to Jerusalem, and now there's tens of thousands of people. You know, it's like you can watch the Red Sox or the Patriots on your TV, but it's another thing to go to the stadium, to go to Fenway or to go to Gillette and be with the tens of thousands of people. It's a different kind of experience. Like, wow, I'm in Red Sox nation. I'm in Patriot nation. I'm in Israel. Look at all the Israelites. Wow, it would have been a kind of mind-blowing experience for the psalmist here. And so he's excited because he gets to go up to the house of the Lord. God's presence is there. God's people are there. And then finally, number three, God's prince. God's prince is there. Look at verse 5. The psalmist says, There, that is in Jerusalem, the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. And David, of course, was the king. He was the king, and, and so David's house was there. The royal palace was there. The, the authority, the governing authority of Israel was there. So it'd be kind of like you're going to Jerusalem, you're a pilgrim, you're there as a tourist back in those days, and people say, look, when you go to Jerusalem, you've got to see two things. You've got to see the temple, make sure you see the temple, take the tour, it costs a little more money, make sure you take the tour, and then, uh, you know, and there's an audio guide, it's great. And then, then there's the palace, you've got to see the palace of King David, you've got to see where the king lives. Like if you go to Washington, D.C., you know, make sure you see the Lincoln Memorial. Make sure you see the White House. And you have this list of things. Well, this is another one of the great buildings in Jerusalem would have been David's palace. And it's there that the king rules. God's king, God's people, God's presence. And so in a sense, in that one place and in that one moment, your average peasant, farmer, shepherd, shepherdess, whatever, 
from Podunkville, Israel, three times a year gets to see the reality of Israel and the people of God. And he knows it's true. When when he's out in his fields all by himself, you know, he knows that he's one of God's people and, and God has a nation and a people. But when you're there in Jerusalem, it's like, there's God's presence Look at his people. It's all right here. And, and there's something that, that's, that's deeper and more visceral and, and emotionally impactful to actually see those things and not just believe in your head that they're real. Here they are. So he's so happy. He's so happy to go up. And it leads him to pray, verse 8. He says, pray. He invites us to pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. So verses 1 to 5 is rejoicing over Jerusalem. Verses 6 to 9 is praying for Jerusalem. That's the the two halves of this psalm. Pray for Jerusalem. But why? Why pray for Jerusalem? What makes Jerusalem so special? What what makes it better than any other city? Is is it sort of magical? Is, Is there something about the city? It's not the city itself. But again, it's because the presence of God is there, the people of God are there, and the prince of God is there. Look at verse 8. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. So he's praying for the city, not for the city itself, like there's something special about that latitude and longitude, but because the people of God go there. Verse 9. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek your prosperity. It's because God put His temple there. And so it's a special city to be prayed for because that's where God's presence and people and prince all abide. And our psalmist is excited. I'd like to suggest, I'd like to argue, maybe you're already kind of making this connection in your own brains, probably are, that it's those same reasons that should make us excited to be with God's people and to worship Him today as we gather together in a local church. It's the same kind of logic. In in fact, the Bible makes some very explicit connections between this love for Jerusalem, this love for the place of God's name and the place of God's people, and the church in the New Testament. Let me show you one of those connections. I'd like you to turn to the New Testament book of Hebrews. It's near the very back of the New Testament. Right before James, we read James earlier. It's the book right before that. Hebrews chapter 12. It's on page 1193 in the Pew Bibles. (coughs) (coughs) Hebrews chapter 12. Anyone else getting slammed by allergies this year? Woo! Bad. (sighs) Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 22, page 1193. And he's saying, so he's, the writer of Hebrews is writing this to to believers in Jesus, to Christians. Look what he says to them. This is so fascinating. He says to Christians, you Christians, in coming to Jesus, have come, you have come to Mount Zion. Now, what is Mount Zion? It's, It's the mountain where, the hill where the temple was in Jerusalem. So it kind of it was a way of referring to Jerusalem and the temple. He said, go to Mount Zion. You've come to Mount Zion. You've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. I've never been to Israel, the literal Israel in the Middle East. I'd love to go someday and see it. I just love that. Never been there. But according to the writer of Hebrews, I've already come to Mount Zion. I've already come to Jerusalem. Because there's a sense in which now Jerusalem, and this, you find this in many places in the New Testament, Jerusalem now, since the coming of Christ, it, the goal of where we're headed is no longer that city in the Middle East, but Jerusalem is the heavenly Jerusalem. That, that the city in the Old Testament was looking forward to and prefiguring this heavenly city that was coming, just like the sacrifices in the Old Testament of the animals and stuff was all pointing forward to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins. And so, so much of the Old Testament was pointing forward to, it was prefiguring and foreshadowing the coming of a greater fulfillment in Jesus. 
And, and so there's a sense in which we as believers, when we've come to Jesus Christ, have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, we're still not there yet. It's still in the future. The book of Revelation ends with that, that heavenly city in the future. And yet there's some sense, the writer of Hebrews is saying, which we're already there. We've come to Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come, keep reading, to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. So there's the big party. There's the the festival celebration. And we've come to the, verse 23, the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. So coming to the church and coming to Christ is coming to the new Jerusalem and to Mount Zion. Verse 23, just to finish it off, you've come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So as we come to Christ, we see that really we're looking forward to a heavenly city whose builder is God. Whereas Paul says in Galatians, the heaven, the Jerusalem that is above is our mother and she is free. So we're looking forward to that city, and there's a sense in which we've already come. So, so it's almost like as we gather in local churches, as, as Christians get together and gather in local churches, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, the, the future home, is kind of existing backwards in time. I'm trying not to sound too sci-fi here, but it, it's like that future reality is already manifesting itself in the present so that even in local churches, there's a foretaste of the heavenly gathering of God's people. And in some sense, we've already come to Jerusalem. We're here. Welcome to Jerusalem. We're here through Christ, even though we look forward to it still. Or think about it this way. Why should we be excited about church? Because that's where God's presence is. That's where God's people are. That's where God's prince rules. So His presence is here with us in a special way. You know, where's the temple now? In the Old Testament, the temple was a building. Where's the temple now in the New Testament? Well, first and foremost, the temple is Jesus. Jesus is the temple. He's the physical place on earth where God dwelled. He was the God-man, the ultimate temple. Do you remember in John chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, but there's a great story in John chapter 2 where Jesus visits the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, he doesn't like what he sees, and so he raises a ruckus, he starts knocking over tables and clearing things out, and the people in the temple are like, whoa, 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 who, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Where did you get authority to do this? And then they said, do, do some miracle to prove that you have authority to do this. And Jesus' answer is, okay, fine. Destroy the temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. Go ahead. Right? And, of course, it's, you know, they think that's lame because they're like, you can't do that. You can't rebuild this temple in three days. And besides, you know, they're not going to tear it down. Hey, what kind of miracle is that? But then John goes on to say immediately, the temple he was talking about was his body. And that's what happened. They did tear down that temple on the cross. And in three days, he did rise again. So he was already... But don't miss the point. Don't miss it. He's standing in the temple saying, tear down the temple. And they still think he's talking about the building, but the the whole building was pointing forward to this moment when the true temple would come, which is Jesus. And now the temple's there. And he's talking about the real temple, and they're still stuck on kind of the prefigurement, which is the building. He's like, I'm the temple. He's God on earth. He's the God-man. He's the, the ultimate expression of God localized among us. Now Jesus has ascended back to heaven. He rose from the dead. He rebuilt the temple in three days. He went to heaven. And now where is His temple on earth today? What does the the New Testament teach us again and again? His temple is the church. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus is the chief cornerstone In in Him, the whole building rises together. All of you are rising together to become a holy temple in the Lord. 1 Peter 2, you're like living stones built together. So again and again and again and again in the New Testament, the temple, the presence, the physical presence of God, the localized presence of God on earth is in the hearts of His people as the Holy Spirit lives in us. Which is ridiculously awesome to think that God 
would allow His Spirit to dwell in our hearts and that we would be His temple. So, so that means in, in the Old Testament, people had to come to the temple to meet with God. But in the New Testament, the temple has legs and it's moving out to find worshipers. That's what we call foreign missions. The gospel spreading out. The temple moving outwards. That's where all these missionaries are going out. It's the temple that's, that's growing across the earth. And as people know Jesus, they, they're become a stone in that temple, and as churches are planted, the temple is growing. It's an amazing, amazing thing that God is doing and that He's the way He's using us. And so that's why we gather in church. It's because God's presence is here. You guys are kind of like, oh, I don't want to go to church. You need to come for the presence of God. And again, I, I know the response. Can I go meet with God anywhere and talk to God anywhere? Yes, you can. Anywhere you can talk to God. It's great. But God has also revealed Himself, manifested Himself in a unique and powerful way at His temple when His people gather together in local congregations. God dwells among His people in in a different kind of way, a powerful way. Haven't you experienced this? This is my whole experience in church. I so often, I, I wish it wasn't this often, but it is, I come into church flat, not spiritually engaged, dragging my feet, haven't really been tuned into the Lord for the last couple days, and I sit in church, and then we sing some song about biblical truth, or Blaine gets up like he did and he reads James, or Blaine gets up like he did and he prays James. Did you guys hear that prayer he prayed? He was just taking James and turning it into a prayer. I don't know if you guys caught that. That was wicked sweet. But I was like, oh, I love it. He's praying the Scripture. He's taking the Scripture and praying it into us. I love that. Or, or you hear a sermon, or after the service, someone from the congregation walks up to you and just says, hey, how you doing? You look down. Can I say a prayer for you? And they pray for you. Or, or, or we have communion together. And, and in that moment, as I'm there, it's like God is there, and He's ministering to me in a powerful way, and it happens so consistently among God's people. It's life in the temple. It's an amazing thing how God does that. It's what the old theologians, I'll give you guys some cool theology lingo. It's what the old theologians used to call the ordinary means of grace. Doesn't that sound kind of boring? The ordinary means of grace. God's powerful grace operates through some very ordinary means like the preaching and teaching and study of His Word, prayer, communion, baptism, meeting with other Christians, fellowshipping together. So often we pray for revival. We pray for an extraordinary move of God here. And we should keep praying for revival. Don't stop praying for that. But you know, revival historically, throughout church history, it comes and then it goes. It doesn't stay forever. It's it's unique periods of blessing. What about all the times when there isn't revival? How is God working? The ordinary means of grace. (laughs) So pray for revivals, yes, but also pray for extraordinary results from the ordinary means of grace. Pray that through the same old boring things, we say, like studying His Word and praying and encouraging each other as a body and taking communion and being together and worshiping Him as a church, that through those ordinary means, God would do extraordinary things among us. That's His normal way of working. Because you're at the temple. The presence of God is here in a powerful way. That's why we gather. But there's a second reason we should be excited about church. Not only do we, do we get to encounter God in a powerful way that maybe we wouldn't encounter Him just in our own personal Bible study, that's good, or our growth group, that's good. But as we gather together as a church, the presence of God is here. Number two, the people of God are here. The people are here. You know, who are the people of God today? In the Old Testament, the people of God were defined as the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then came Jesus, and He was like the ultimate descendant of Abraham. He's the ultimate seed or offspring of Abraham. And now God's people are defined not by ethnicity and biological descent, but by faith in Jesus. So so if you want to be a person of God, a child of God, 
You have to come through Jesus and in Him. You know, Jesus is the ultimate descendant of Abraham. Jesus is Israel. He's the ultimate Israelite. And so to be Israel, to be God's people, you have to be in Christ. And, and He's the ultimate Adam, you know, who spawns the new human race. Jesus fulfills all of those things. And so now we, we can be a part of the people of God, not just Jewish people, but, you know, all kinds of people. I mean, Africans can be part of the people of God, and Asians can be part of the people of God, and Arabs can be part of the people of God, and even like Irish people and Italian people. It's amazing. Incredible. All these people coming in to be part of the people of God all through the way that Jesus has opened, blown the door wide open to heaven through His death and resurrection, and all may enter through Him Amazing, amazing. And so now here we are with God's people. We're all together. One of the things I shared in uh, my report that that I did with Godwin and Blaine just before the service on our uh, recent mission trip to Dubai, we visited a church in Dubai. I got to preach there, and we got to worship with them. And it's a church in Dubai, uh, about 900,000 people who get together and worship. And uh, Dubai is a very cosmopolitan city. And so there were probably 50 or 60 different nations represented in the congregation. I mean, that was, that was worth, the, worth the price of the trip right there, to stand up and look out and see a church with 50 or 60 different nations represented. I'm like, this is a little picture of the ultimate church service someday when we'll all be together. And I could just see all of them together. My heart was rejoicing to see the people of God you know, that's why, maybe you pick this up, that's why I'm so excited this summer that we're going to have one worship service. I'm giddy. Everyone's like, oh, you're just happy because you only have to preach once. I'm like, no, I actually like preaching twice and I actually get better in the second service, just so you know. You're like, that's better? Huh. Anyway, I love preaching twice. I preach three times. I love to preach. The reason I love to have one worship service is the same reason here. I get to see all the people of God together. And my heart's just like, there they are. There's the church, the assembly. That's what church means, assembly. And they're all assembled. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. And, and my heart rejoices just like the, the psalmist's heart rejoices to see all the tribes together three times a year. And so I, I rejoice to see you all together. Maybe like how a grandma or grandpa feels when he sees all the family at the family reunion. Oh, they're all together. Take pictures. Remember this moment. Do you rejoice in the people of God? That's a reason to love coming to church, to be around God's people. So you've got to love God's people. It's one of the main motivations. God's presence is there. God's people are there. Uh, that's why we stress in our church, church membership. You know, if you're, if you're a Christian, you should find a church, become a member of it wherever that church is. Commit yourself to that church. And being a church member doesn't just mean having your name on a list. I'm a member of that church. But it means getting your life involved with other people's lives, whether that's through a growth group or taking people out to lunch or doing a Bible study in your home or whatever, just being involved in each other's lives. See, if you're a member of a church, let's say you're a member of this church, but you don't really fellowship with other Christians in this church on any kind of regular basis. You're not regularly in any kind of way meeting with other Christians from this church, so you're really not intertwining your lives as fellow members in this church. Well, then you're not going to be that excited to see the people of God because you won't know anybody. And it won't be that. It won't thrill you the same way. Even if you're an introvert. Do we have any introverts here who just don't like people that much? Okay. You know, if you had like two friends, that would be fine. You know, if you're a Lego, you only got like two pegs for two friends to go on it. Um, you know, anyone, you know so there's some of us who are like that. We're like, I don't like a lot of people. I don't like crowds. You know, if, if being a recluse wasn't uncool, I'd be a recluse. Uh, you know, even you, you need people. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just someone in this church. Meet with someone one-on-one to read the Bible. That's simple Christian fellowship. But, but the more that we know the people and that we're members of the church the more we're excited. It's like, who's preaching this Sunday? Oh, I don't know. I don't really care. But I'm going to see this person. Haven't seen them all week. They've been gone. I want to see them again. I want to connect with that person. This is my family, and I want to see the people of God. And so may God cultivate in us a love for one another and a delight in each other.
Pastors come and pastors go. You know, ministries come and ministries go. But the church is the people who love each other. When the church loves each other and the people are knit together, that kind of congregation can weather all kinds of things. It always happens that way. It's the love and the unity of the body committed to each other. So let's love going to church. Let's love gathering with God's people. Why? Because God's presence is there in a unique way. God's people are there. And then, of course, the third one, God's prince is there. Jesus Christ is present among his people. He is the prince. He's the head of the body, the church, where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst of them. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Lord Jesus is present presiding over the supper through His Spirit, encouraging us and feeding us. As we study God's Word together, Jesus is speaking to us. You know, if He's the King, His Word then is His his law. This is the Word of the King. And so just as the, the psalmist loved to go to Jerusalem and hear the teachings of the King and the instructions of the King, so we gather together as a church. And that's why we're always studying the Bible or studying in the Bible study because we want to hear the words of the King. Like all week, we've just heard nonsense. All week, it's been like tweets and Facebook and talk shows and and pundits, and it's just like blah, 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 blah. So tired of hearing it. I'm so tired of hearing myself. So are you. And we need to hear the king. We need to hear the king. And so it's so important that, that that we study God's word together because we want to hear what the king has to say to us. That's why it's important if if you are looking for a church or if you ever find yourself not here or you're going somewhere else or maybe you relocate and you're trying to find a church home and you go to that church shopping thing, which is incredibly painful and tiring. If you've ever had to do church shopping before. But you walk into a church, number one question you should be asking, am I hearing the Bible taught in this church? If you're not, out. (laughs) That was great. God bless you guys. I need to find a place where I can hear the Bible. You know? Even if, you know, I don't care if it's not a Baptist church, it doesn't matter. Go to a place where you hear God's Word. Because God's Word is how he, He'll feed your soul and strengthen you. So we come to church. We, we gather with God's people. We rejoice in it because I know when I gather with you, ah, I'm going to meet with God and I'm going to see His people and I'm going to be in the presence of the King That should give us joy. It's a different way of thinking about gathering. It's not just what am I going to get out of it, but it's what's there and what's my role in it. Awesome vision for life together as a church. And once you start to love the church, the people, and you start to love the presence of God and what He's doing, then that will lead you to pray for the church. Pray for the church. Because here's the other side of it. I try to paint like an exciting picture from the Scriptures of the spiritual realities of the church. But the fact is, the churches are imperfect. They're flawed. Some of them are sick, unhealthy. Even churches that teach the Bible, they can still be, have problems. So you also have to be praying for the church. So you're like, yay, that was a great sermon. I'm going to jump into the church. Whoa, what did I jump into? Oh, there's a problem here. Yep. There's no perfect churches. You know the old saying, if you ever do find a perfect church, please don't join. You'll ruin it. Um, there's no such thing because they're, they're full of people who are sinful like me who are all still trying to get there. So yeah, we've already come to the New Jerusalem, but we haven't yet made it. We're still in pilgrimage. So that means that if you love the church, you need to pray for the church. And the more you get involved, the more things you're going to find to pray for, okay? You're just going to find lots of things to pray for. Pray for the church. Do you, do you pray for this congregation? Do you pray for other congregations that you know about? Maybe you have some kind of special connection to another church across town because you know someone there used to go there. You should pray for that church regularly. Uh, one of the ways I've, I've tried to practice this is, uh, this is my beat-up prayer list. Uh, this is a list of all five, the current 588 members of South Shore Baptist Church. And I just took the list and I divided it into uh, 30 sections. So every day I just take a little section and pray. So like by the end of the month I prayed for every all the members, and I just try to do that every month. And I'm telling you, this is probably one of the best things for my own soul that I've done is just praying for you. Then I see you, and I'm like, hey, I was just praying for you Tuesday. What's, what's going on with this? Oh, I'll pray about that. Okay, thanks, and I'll remember that. And just, it's a way to know people. Just pray for them and uh, encourage you to do that. Just pray for the people you know. Pray for the people in your Bible study. Make some kind of regular habit out of praying for the church because the church needs your prayers big time. 
because you know how we are, because you know how you are. We're all in process, all making progress together. Let me make one final comment, then I'll stop. And, and, and I want to address a question that maybe some of you are thinking. We're talking about praying for the church and rejoicing. But some of you may be thinking, but, but, but wait a minute. Doesn't it say back in Psalm 122, pray for Jerusalem? Shouldn't we still be praying for Jerusalem, the actual city in the Middle East? Okay, yeah, yeah, the church, New Jerusalem, got it. But what about just what the psalm says? Pray for Jerusalem. Should we pray for Jerusalem in the Middle East, the actual city? I would say, yeah, big time. Pray for Jerusalem. But especially pray for peace. And I'm talking about a peace that's deeper than all the different groups getting along and not hurting each other. I'm talking about the peace that comes when we're reconciled to God through Jesus. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem that Jesus, the Messiah of Jerusalem, would be known and worshipped there. That His Jewish people, of whom Jesus was a Jew, would come to know Jesus and join the new people of God. Because the gospel goes to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And then after you've prayed for Jerusalem, keep praying. Make sure you pray for Istanbul and pray for Baghdad. Pray for Jakarta. Pray for Beijing and Shanghai and Seoul and Tokyo. Be sure to pray for Moscow. And don't forget Dublin or San Paulo, or Mexico City. And don't forget Boston. And don't forget Marshfield, or Plymouth, or Hull. You need to pray, pray for the peace of the world, the peace that only comes when our hearts are first at peace with God through Christ, who died to make peace. The peace that we have with each other comes when we have peace with God through Christ. So pray that God would bring us to peace through the gospel. May I ask you, have you made peace with God through the gospel? Are you still under the illusion that you can make peace with God just by trying to be a better religious person? Or have you not come to see that you need a Savior? You're a sinner in need of a Savior. That God has sent His Son Jesus to die for all kinds of people. The perfect Savior for total sinners like us. Is your faith in Christ? There's still room for more in the pilgrimage. There's still room for more in the assembly. The door is not shut yet. And I would just invite you to come, to come to Christ and put your faith in Him. Let's pray. (coughs) Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank You for sending Jesus to us. Thank you for including us into your people and your temple. Lord, we do pray that we would be a peace-loving people, a people who love the gospel. Lord, I pray that we would love your church. God, I pray that we would love your presence here. We pray that your presence would be more manifestly felt here. I pray, God, that, uh, that we would love your people who are here. Help us, God, to build relationships and to not just be members, but to practice membership in, in the one another's of the New Testament. And God, I pray that we would submit to the rule of the King through His Word. And Lord, I pray that uh, if there's anyone who doesn't know You, Jesus, that You would show them Yourself, that You are the risen Savior. And God, would You pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Pray for the people of that great city, that they would come to know You, Jesus. Lord, we also pray for the people of Tehran. Lord, we pray for the people of Paris. Lord, we pray for people all over the world in every country who need you. God, give us a heart. Give us a heart for people, to love people of all different walks of life and backgrounds. Give us your heart, Jesus, for the world, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.